thank you all so much for being here today. We are really delighted to be able to introduce you to Fernanda Paiva of Hitchhiking Skies. She is a true expert in, in astrology and she approaches her craft um, in such a beautiful way. It's really characterized by care and compassion and a genuine desire to bring healing to those that she works with. Her sensitivity and focus on the positive aspects of astrology I find set her apart in her field. She's really determined to challenge the sometimes negative norms that reside within astrology and instead she offers positive interpretations which help guide her clients to empowerment and growth. As part of her sort of mission to empower and guide everybody on their spiritual paths, she's also kind enough to be our resident astrologer in the Witcher Circle. So TWC is a membership we host, which provides a safe space for people looking for community and connection. And we offer guidance so that people can deepen their understanding of astrology, lunar magic, and much more while also embracing their spiritual journey and connecting with a really vibrant community of like-minded souls. Fernanda is originally from Brazil, and she kind of resides between Brazil and the UK. And she's got a decade of experience in her field and a really impressive list of qualifications to match. She just got her master's degree on the 7th, which is super exciting. Put a couple of people in. Um, and she also has a certificate in astrology from the London School of Astrology. Um, and she also has a couple of kind of witchy degrees under her belt. She's a level two Reiki practitioner. Um, and is working with Bach Dauer Remedies. She teaches, mentors, and coaches for people all over the world, and we've only heard amazing things from her, and she's just such a pleasure to have here. So, warm welcome. Thanks for being here, Fernanda. Oh, thank you so much, Amara. That's a um, very kind introduction. I feel very welcome, uh, and I'm very happy to be here as well. Yeah, that's brilliant. Maybe, Fernanda, quickly, you could give us a little rundown on kind of your approach to astrology. And we talked a little bit about um, kind of being a highly sensitive person on HSP and how that also could be called kind of being an empath and how that kind of impacts on both astrology and life and how those two connect. I would love to hear your take. Sure. On. Sure. Um, well, to begin, then a little bit of my approach to astrology. So I like to say that I work with constructive astrology and um, and also coming from a more Western contemporary humanistic sort of person-centered astrology as well. So um, very influenced by psychological astrology as well, where most of the focus is about the person right in front of you or the people that are listening to you as well. So it's all about personal growth. It's all about using the cycles that we see with the planets to grow as well as, as, as a person, to manifest the life that we want to have, to, you know, to be creative with what we have as well. So I feel that our natal charts are like our little blueprint and we have a lot of possibilities on how we can manifest that in our lives. And so someone that has Mars Saturn might feel scared of anger and might have difficulties with anger, but it can also channel, channel that energy into willpower, controlling you know, their, their will, um, staying power as well as another one that I can think of with a Mars Saturn. And a way that you can do that is by doing martial arts. So so what I love about this kind of astrology and the way that I want or that I love to work with astrology is to see the chart and brainstorm in that way. So we can brainstorm in, in beautiful ways that you can use what you have and you can channel what you have in a way that excites you, that brings you joy, that you know makes you feel alive and, and, and makes you feel you. Because I think this is also my main values, like authenticity and, and being yourself as well. So this is really important to me. Um, in terms of the high sensitivity and the um, empath as well, that's a very good question as well, Amara, because I've always been dabbling into the empath and I've had various friends telling me that I am an empath and that they were empaths as well. And I was like, okay, I'm a Virgo. I have a lot of Virgo in my chart. I tend to be a little bit more rational. And, um, and it was when I read some of the things. So HSP basically is a term that was coined by Elena Ron, and it was a it was an academic research in the 90s. So she started um, researching on this 
you know, and I think she was inspired by her uh, therapist saying that she's highly sensitive. And she was like, oh, I wonder if that's a thing. So she started looking into that. And um, and she found out that there is a way, I think, is on the spectrum of neurodivergency. And, and it does relate to being more sensitive to your environment, to um to the energies around you and it's it's very much to what I think we understand of an empath you feel other people's emotions you feel the you know the energy of a crowd very strongly you might want to hide if you're there you know because you're feeling too much um it might relate to physical sensations you know the people that really need to cut off like the tags from clothes and <laughs> things like that because they really like itchy clothes are really like um yeah hard or you're the first one to smell something in the house so that kind of relates to the sensitivity and I find that with astrology we can harness this sensitivity as well so I'm sort of looking into charts I'm I'm beginning to do that because I'm doing a training on coaching highly sensitive people so I've been doing a lot of practices with um, HSPs as well and getting their charts so I'm doing a little bit of a research if I can see these traits reflected in the charts. But but I believe that one of the, the biggest um, things that I can think of is that we can navigate our cycles. And I think this is one of the most useful things that astrology can provide us, is this sort of like navigator. And we can, you know, because life and astrology is cycles within cycles, within cycles. And so uh, being very sensitive, I have the feeling that we feel things beforehand. So Venus is turning retrograde tomorrow. I've been feeling it already. And, you know, this week I've been already like kind of like sensing that there is something. And um, so I, I have the feeling that us that identify with the sensitivity of being an empath, we can pick up on these planetary transits more strongly. So we can use them to our benefit. We can navigate our lives in a, in a wiser way um more conscious about what's going on and you know use that to our benefit so that's my answer in a nutshell I guess have I answered the question because sometimes I digress and <laughs> that was amazing that was really um I mean just also mentioning that you feel the energies of of the planetary movement so strongly and you think that maybe that is because you have HSP mm -hmm. HSP um we have a couple of questions so no. there's Chat and I'll just ask them. So, what is the significance of having a natal Aries moon with the shift of Aries into the North Node? Uh, having a what? Having a natal Aries moon with okay. the shift of Aries into the North Node. Okay, cool. So, uh, you don't have the North Node in Aries, though. Is your natal moon right? Cool. So, with the with the lunar nodes, the transits of the lunar nodes, what I've observed along the years is that there's usually something that we're um, we're collectively sharing this because it's happening in the sky to all of us. So it's something about evolution and it's something about collective growth that we're all going through with these nodes, right? So when we have a personal planet in one of these signs of the nodes, especially when the node is crossing over those degrees, because you have a moon in Aries, but it will be between zero to 29. So I don't know, and I don't know if you know as well, which degree your moon is going to be, but the node is at 29 right now. So let's Let's say you have a moon at 29 my feeling is that something of these Aries lesson is like it's like your role to play in this collective evolution you're somehow invited to play a role in what we're all witnessing um I also tend to think that lunar nodes they usually reflect important relationships in our lives as well. So when we have a transit from a lunar nodes on our ascendants, on our mid heavens, or in somewhere important in our charts, there's usually someone in our lives that, that come about. And it might not be romantic, but there is usually something um, important of these relationships as well. So I do think that it is significant. And it has to do with this sort of evolutionary growth that we're all kind of grow going through. I, I really love the nodes I've been like more and more interested you know over the years I think I'm becoming more and more interested in it and I guess because I'm getting older <laughs> I've had more of a chance to observe it for longer um in my own chart so yeah so I de definitely think it's significant yeah does that answer the question Lauren if um you've got further questions you can drop them in the chat and in the meantime um Rebecca asked as a complete newbie there's mm -hmm. a lot information out there and it's very confusing do you have any recommendations of more reliable sources 
Sure. Um, I think astro.com is one of the best websites for astrology. I'm sure they've got some like uh, introductory, you know, beginners uh, things there as well, but it's very, very trustworthy. And in fact, is is my main place, my go-to place when I'm looking for people's charts, like famous people. Uh, I'm always like going to astro.com. So that's definitely really good. In general, what I would say is if it creates anxiety and fear, I think that's not very good astrology because astrology is a lens that we use to look into reality and to make meaning as well. And if that's just creating a, a sense of anxiety and fear on you, I don't think it's doing its job. I feel that its job is for us. Sometimes some transits might be a bit scary and a bit uncomfortable, but we're using that to empower ourselves. We're not just talking about that so people are going to be scared. So so my my usual advice is that if we create that kind of, has that yucky feeling when you're on a web session reading an article, then is is not very good astrology that's how i um uh, define it when i was beginning as well i used to look a lot at um cafe astrology i think it's called and they have a lot of like beginners things there as well and i really like it as it is a nice uh website as well and i i have books that i can recommend you as well like some of the beginners i oftentimes use sue tompkins the contemporary astrologer's handbook and again it depends on the kind of astrology you want to explore more as well, because there's so many different types. Um, one of the first things we learn in the EMA is that there is no astrology, but astrologies in plural. So we've got so many different types. We've got Chinese and Vedic astrology. And, and, and another thing that we came across in the EMA as well is that astrologers are usually the the professionals that most disagree with each other. And, you know, they disagree on techniques, they disagree on types of astrology. And I think, um it's really about following your intuition and what you feel drawn to like I I feel drawn to psychology you know more I have these interests so so that kind of led me towards the direction I took um yeah so the Sue Tompkins book um the contemporary astrologer's handbook is more in the sort of humanistic contemporary western astrology um which is you know the astrology i do most but if you're interested in some other kind you know you can also write in the chat box and i can think if i know any other sources that i would recommend yeah yeah so all good re really good places to start so we have another question that is a little bit more complicated so i'll read it a little bit slowly so soul is that she has pluto in a strong opposition within 0 0.3 degrees with, with, a, with 0 0.3 degrees okay yeah with ascendant is this aspect something to be aware of when power and ego conflicts arise power and ego conflicts arise in partnerships is oh yeah Pluto as her descendant um making her healing and transformational journey even more challenging right yeah um what's her name soul soul nice okay so yeah absolutely i mean i think um pluto any planet that is falling on an angle so if it's on your ascendant if it's on your midheaven on your descendant on your ic as well opposite the midheaven they're usually going to feature very strongly in your life and you're going to experience that planet very strongly now pluto i mean Pl before talking about Pluto, on the descendant will have something to do with relationships, will have something to do with people that you attract into your life. So if we place Pluto there, I mean, Pluto is the god of the underworld, right? So it has to do with everything that's hidden, that's buried, our compulsions, our obsessions, our, um, you know, um phobias are reflected by pluto as well but it's a kind of a um a downwards trip that we take in order to re-empower ourselves so pluto is the modern ruler of scorpio so it resonates with that scorpionic flavor it's almost like having a scorpio descendant you feel attracted to passionate um relationships passionate partners relationship as a way to do a kind of an alchemical exchange as well it's like depth is very important um so again always keep in mind that with astrology we have the worst the best 
and all the colors in between. So the way that you can negotiate your fate is by trying to channel this into more positive ways. So rather than being with the worst of Pluto, which would be a partner that's very manipulative, that's, you know, a narcissist or a sociopath and is trying to manipulate you and da da da, you can go for somebody that's very psychologically aware, or you can be attracted to someone that's a shaman, you know, someone that that's really into their personal transformation as well. You could also offer that kind of work. That's another way that you can channel this. So after going through your own journey into the underworld, which is inevitable, especially when you're younger, um, you sort of rise back, you know, as a phoenix, which is another symbol connected to Scorpio, where you can you can channel these energy and facilitate that process to other people. So you can be a shaman yourself, or you can be a psychologist, or you know, anything that facilitates a strong transformation helping people to go get over trauma for example because Pluto re, um, reflects trauma as well so you'd be able to do that kind of work as well if you wish um, but it definitely does have a very strong influence in your chart if it's so close um, on your descendant is definitely definitely a, a strong part of who you are and it's important to integrate that planet in the best way be um, conscious of that energy yeah yeah cool. thank you for that answer that was awesome mm. maria asked what is the rising sign or ascendant and why is it important right nice sure so the ascendant or the rising sign i mean the word rising already gives a clue there is the constellation that appears to be rising so the zodiacal sign that appears to be rising on the horizon when we're born now that's not really the constellation as in the stars up there because they're they've got various different shapes and, and sizes the zodiacal is the ecliptic that we call it which is the path of the sun um around you know so 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 we kind of divided that and and that's how we divided the houses it was a kind of a an abstraction but the rising sign will be that ecliptic in like in intersection to the horizon so it's literally like the you know if you look at where the sun rises where the sun will be rising in connection that's why it's so important to know where you were as well when you were born because it will be that point there based on where you were the point where the sun rises and we'd look at the path in the ecliptic what which one of the zodiacal signs was rising in that moment now why that's important is because symbolically the ascendant will be connected with how we come into the world as well it's like it, it usually tells the story of your birth so it can be that literal of like how you came into the world literally through your birth but it also reflects how you give birth to new phases in your life how you tend to initiate things and it also reflects your sense of identity when we go into a party and we don't know anybody we usually go into our ascendant mode is a is a kind of a carrier is like um it's like a vehicle that we sort of get by and we and we interact especially on a one-to-one -one basis so the way that you literally shake hands with people when you're meeting them for the first time that's going to be your ascendant as well so the ascendant as well as all of the other three angles so they're all like the four angles that we call in astrology the ascendant descendant the midheaven and the ic they're going to be very sensitive points when we have transits when we have interactions with other people as well so let's say my sun is on your ascendant or your moon is on my ascendant so that reflects a very powerful connection between people an immediate recognition um so they're very um sensitive points in the astrology chart and is how we interact with the outer world as well like how we manifest our inner world into the outer world and how we do that exchange so the ascendant is definitely a very very important um place in the chart that you want to get acquainted with um yeah yeah awesome thank you does anybody else um here have a have a question otherwise i have a couple from instagram if you're thinking of your questions nice um so one of the questions we had was someone said that they were born into, so Aquarius is their sign and they feel like they really connect to that, but they were born three weeks earlier than they were meant to be. And does that have any impact at all? Okay. Well, that's a metaphysical question, isn't it? It's like, there's like some, you know, current of astrologers that, was to think about the conception chart so it's not even like when you were born or before you were 
born is like when you're actually being conceived, which is very difficult. I mean, how do you find that? <laughs> you to your parents, you know, when did you actually make me? I mean, hmm. yeah. So that's an interesting question. I do tend to believe that things happen the way they are meant to be. There's an interesting set of um, research also done in the astrological community about cesareans. So the last two decades or you know so especially in the rich countries you don't have natural birth so much or as often I mean maybe people like us would value that more but in the majority you know the the, the rest of the world they usually just book a cesarean so so there is a lot of ascendants that would be born in the middle of the night or you know that are not really being born um in in first world countries because of that but that's a bit of a, an interesting digression here I tend to think that um, that whatever happens happens in 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 sort of connection to how it should be. So I believe that things happen for a reason. I I kind of see a synchronicity in the way that the world works, and and obviously for being an astrologer, um, that definitely fuels like my astrology as well. Like I see things very organically, and if you were born three weeks earlier, it was meant to be. But it might be that you have other planets in Aquarius if you do. Um, I don't know how acquainted you are with your whole astrological chart, but a lot of people that say I'm born the cusp and I really identify with this sign, not with that one. When you look at their charts, they've got like four planets in the other signs. So I'm not surprised they identify as, you know, the other sign or the sun sign. So, yeah, so it might be the case, you know, that you you have other planets there. Yeah. It's the thing about cesareans is super interesting. Mm. I'll talk to you more about that at some point because it's uh, fascinating. I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Me too. I mean, yeah. Is a uh, Wendy Stacy. She's a very respected astrologer in the community. She's from New Zealand originally, but she's based in the UK as well, and she's been doing this research for a while now. And and I love it as well. It's like what an interesting question. Like, are we changing the population of the world? You know, astrologically because we're just booking. It's just commercial time. People are born between nine and six <laughs> because it's like a kind of a, an appointment that we create. You know, artificially. So yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. We actually have a couple of questions. So we had one on Instagram, and I see we've got one here. And you just also mentioned it. So obviously we're meant to talk about it. Nice. But- a question about being on the cusp so Chris asked here if your moon sign which is cancer is almost in the next sign does that make a difference and we also had a question about um basically does being on the cusp have an impact so I think those two kind of go quite well yeah yeah um so just uh, repeat me the first one is it the moon being on the cusp if your moon sign which is in cancer is almost in the next sign does that make a difference I suppose right cool it's the same it's a very similar question because when you're born in the cusp it means that the sun was right at the you know at the edge of shifting signs right now like I mentioned before every zodiacal sign because it's being created and divided has from zero to 29 degrees so every sign has that and it's like the wheel divided by 12 you know the 360 degrees blah blah blah. I mean maths really eludes me I'm not gonna go into detail in that but the zero to 29 degrees are very important. And from the, you know, the school where I come from, the London School of Astrology and all of that, and um, from my personal observations as well, I guess, there is something that we call anoretic degrees, which is the zero or the 29. So they're called the crisis degrees. They're like, I'm about to change, but not so much, not yet. Now, what happens with those degrees is they, they're very strong in the sign. They're not really a little bit of the next sign. So it's actually the opposite of what we believe. Um in my perspective and you know where I studied as well that's what how we used to see so if you're zero Aries you're very Aries and if your moon is at 29 Cancer then it's very Cancerian as well the thing with the moon though is that you have to have a more precise birth time because if it's a little bit later the moon may have shifted signs and you don't know so so with the moon it's important to have a more precise time whereas with the sun not as much I have seen very sporadic cases of people that were born on a day that the sun shifted signs and so there was a little bit of a you know question mark there but um but usually it's easier to see the sun so if you're 29 or zero degree of something is very strong degree of that something yeah 
it's interesting that's almost counterintuitive like you said so you'd think you would be sort of merging into the next sign so to be more strongly that sign just because you're on the very edge of it is really an interesting idea yeah and and it also has a little bit of a difference as well like the zero degrees is very fresh so it has a kind of a a, a sort of a childlike quality to that sign as well it's like that sign in its rawest um form whereas the 29 is the most dilapidated form because it's the last degree seeing all it's like the old wise man like you know it's very um yeah i've seen everything so i know everything uh signs so they have a little bit of a different manifestation as well yeah chris says that um they're at 29 degrees so it really helps because they also thought it would be the opposite yeah and I mean uh, this is also another thing that you know because when you start looking at astrology charts and I hope that all of you are in the you know beginnings or already intermediate or whatever or that you're going to feel more curious to do after this Q&A session but um but the thing as well is that we have ways of finding patterns that are very important to you in your natal charts and when you look at that picture how do you know what's more important or less important etc and usually planets with 29 degrees are very important <laughs> so 29 degrees zero degrees they usually considered a very strong planet in that chart so I usually pay more attention to that as well you know that moon would be very strong in your chart Chris um yeah I would consider that so if I saw your chart Bill, I'm moon at 29 so that moon is definitely very powerful there yeah so somebody else has said can you speak more to the idea of compatibility between someone who has their sun sign and your moon sign mm -hmm. reference to an interview that was on the red carpet recently which I haven't seen yeah nice absolutely I mean sun moon so there are certain classic inter aspects that we talk about when it comes to um you know compatibility in astrology that are the main like the famous ones let's put it that way um and the sun moon conjunction especially you know when my son is in libra your moon is in libra and we have that interchange there and again you need to keep an eye on degrees because if my my son is a 15 and your moon is a 15 then they're really close together and it will be felt more strongly um so absolutely i mean carl jung i think observed that interchanges between sun and moon moon and ascendant and you know some of these interchanges were very um strongly in weddings that really lasted now obviously he was doing that research in the 50s or something i don't know how many people divorced at that time so we also need to take into consideration the time that he was doing that but what i find is that there is an intrinsic affinity when we have a sun moon interchange a strong sun moon interchange um and you know there are a few other aspects as well that will be reflective of a strong affinity that we have with somebody there is a sense of um feeling comfortable with that person and and the the, the moon person tends to want to nurture the sun person is usually when you have your moon very activated you feel <coughs> you feel the need to nurture the other person you feel very lunar around that person uh -huh. um I think there's somebody that was um, unmuted there. But um, sorry, I'm just going to mute everybody just because we've got some interference coming through. So if you have a question to ask and you'd like to ask it, please unmute yourself. Like we just have a bit of um, yeah, something in. Nice. Yeah. Right. So so yeah, absolutely. The sun moon is like you know the cosmic marriage kind of aspect. But again, like I mean, I've I've had that with friends, with people that I just really got along well with, and we had no romantic um, interest on each other. And in fact, I've had a coworker who had Mars conjunction. So I think his Mars was conjunction my Venus. Um, his son was conjunction my moon as well and I had zero romantic feelings towards him what happened was that we got along really well at work like we didn't have to speak like I you know it was um, hospitality we were working in a very busy cafe I didn't have to speak I just look at him you know I needed help and he would come along and you know and we just worked really well together but there was nothing in terms of you know ooh, we have to have a romantic relationship so I think these interchanges talk about how much you know how warm we feel towards somebody or not um how much can we see ourselves on somebody as well and and if we're made of similar elements and you know and and materials as well so we kind of get each other's perspective but there are so many different cases and 
Um, so many different ways of working. Compatibility astrology can be quite complex and wonderful because of that as well. Um, yeah, I really love relationship astrology. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. I really appreciate that you mentioned that this compatibility doesn't always have to be romantic because I do mm-hmm. think it's such a huge value in friendships as well. And if, you know, maybe your charts just kind of fit really well together and so it doesn't always have to be this um, soulmate. Yeah. Life kind of relationship like I do think our friends are also such an important part of our life and cultivating friendships and finding the ones that really work for us are also so important yeah yeah I mean there was a time I was doing like proper research like with my own life like the people that I would meet you know one night stands that I would have like I just look at the chats and be like oh my god I could talk to that person so easily what's there or you know and I was just really observing everything that was happening and how I felt and it's fascinating to see from that perspective you know how um interactions are very particular and and you know yeah yeah Rebecca asked another question which was that um she'd never before connected being an empath with having extreme physical sensitivity and also being sensitive to things like being unable to sleep during full moons Mm. she asks does this also affect our connections to other signs what do you mean does that affect our connection to other signs like in what way what I don't know if I understood the question I think I would read that into having this extreme sensitivity Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what sign you are Rebecca so I can't speak to that but having extreme sensitivity kind of just impacting our ability to connect to other people oh um I think so I mean I think when we have a very strong sensitivity we connect very deeply as well like we have a ten you know because imagine that like usually like the example I can think of is like when you get burned and you have like this fresh new skin that's sort of like rising up and it's very very fresh and it's soft and it's you know it hurts very very easily and so imagine that most people have a thicker skin like literally as well like in the the way that we use it you know they don't care so much and they don't take it so personally but when you're very sensitive you know you feel things more deeply so you have an ability to feel what the other person feels but you also um might feel hurt as well you know so I think that there is an impact in relationships but it doesn't have to be negative um I think what's important is to is to be very self-aware of your of your needs and of your of your boundaries like where like what are your real needs and 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 do that with the communication as well you know I think this is such a game changer when you're aware of your needs you're aware that you're sensitive you don't feel guilty about it because you know it's a real thing and you have the right to be yourself and so you learn how to communicate that as well to to your partner potential partners you know it's like I need downtime I need to spend more time alone because we went to that gig yesterday so I need to be alone and so it doesn't have to impact in a negative way and it can actually impact in a very wonderful way that you're very empathetic and and you can really you know connect on a very deep level so that's my take on it that's how I see it yeah yeah I hope that answers the question Rebecca I think if you have any further carry-on questions feel free to drop them in the chat and I can ask for you Daisy Mm -hmm. So wondered um, what were the roots of Western astrology and how do these relate to other questions, which you briefly touched on earlier, saying that there's all of these different schools, you know. Mm. And yeah, and- well, I think I think if I'm not wrong, it's like more like the Sumerians already, like the Babylonians. It's like very, very old. And they, they really used it. I mean, astrology and the sky really first like astrology and astronomy weren't a separate thing until you know the enlightenment so it was a very very long time that they were the same thing and it was really our relationship to the sky now if you try and transport yourself to the past I mean there was no you know electricity there was no nothing that life as we understand is completely different the, our relationship to time now is completely and absolutely different to what it used to be the sky was a resource like the sky was a resource that you know it was a calendar it was a map you know it was a navigator as well that people would use to navigate the seas and 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 to know 
when to harvest or when to seed or when to, you know, how to work with nature, really. I mean, the sky was this incredible resource. And at that time, astrology really wasn't for the peasants, for the commoners. They only used astrology for the kings and the, you know, the actual like leaders and the important people. And and this is the thing with the with the with the EMA that became so clear to me is that astrology is a reflection of culture. There's not there isn't one without the other. So so astrology kept morphing and and changing as we also changed and you know we 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 sort of moved on as you know I'm not saying moved on in a sense we're better or anything like that but like the history kept unfolding and so did astrology in so many ways and for instance I see a tendency now in the younger generations to like traditional astrology I'm very curious about that and I wonder um why you know because my generation which is youngish <laughs> not really young anymore uh, we were very much into psychological astrology, but now I've I've noticed that with the younger generations, there is a kind of a wave of like, actually, we're very much into traditional. We don't want any of the psychological. So I wonder what that reflects about their generation and, you know, and what the psychology, you know, reflects of my generation. I don't know, but I think there's definitely that, that um, interconnection there, you know, with, um, the Western astrology, you know, coming from Babylonia and the Sumerians and, and Greece, obviously. I mean, Greek Hellenistic astrology was also another, you know, path there. Um, but yeah, that's, I don't know. And then he went sort of into the underworld because with the Enlightenment, it became like ridiculed, you know, it lost its place in academia and et cetera. So, so then it became this, there's a lot of, there is a lot of academics that research in astrology saying, why do people still believe in astrology? And they come with this really biased perspective of like, this can't be possible because it's just, uh, um, what's the name of that? When people believe in things that are just bonkers, you know, it's just um, superstition and da da da. And so I, I encountered a lot of papers like that. Um, and it is, is real, you know, I mean, I think, we talk a lot about a sort of a rising of astrology again. Yeah, exactly. Pseudoscience. One of the things we said in the MA is like astrology is usually defined as something that is not. So it's not enough of religion. So the religious people don't like it. It's not a science. So the scientific people don't like it. But it hasn't really been defined as a thing in its own. Like, you know, so it was a wonderful MA because we asked ourselves all of these questions. Um, yeah. And now I feel that there is a kind of a rising again in popularity. And obviously we're in the digital era where there's this, you know, there's so much information out there about everything. And and I do feel that people are, um, I don't know, maybe more interested, but I, I do face a lot of prejudice. Yeah, a lot of prejudice um, being an astrologer, you know, like people thinking that you're dumb, that you believe in hocus pocus or, you know, that you're like, yeah, which is a, a reflection of our culture as well you know like Richard Dawkins and you know the god delusion and yeah yeah do you have any methods that you use to cope with that mm, that's a good question yeah I do I think I think the masters has been like a complete like watershed in my life because it's helped me to think about all of this so deeply and uh, like to not really try to convince them of anything you know it's like um and to see that as like, this is the world view, you know, and one of the things I think is like, and I question them is, you know, this um, attempt to colonize um, knowledge, you know, knowledge is knowledge. We have so many different, like, why is poetry and literature respected? You know, it's not real and <laughs> it's not scientific, but yet it's still respected. My brother had this really interesting um, argument because obviously he's my brother, we get along really well. And after I really went into astrology like years ago, he started respecting more. And so some of his friends are really skeptical. He would have these discussions and and with one of them, and I love it because my brother is like, you know, he's got quite a bit of Aquarius there. He's like quite a clever man. And he had this argument with his friend, which I loved. And I think this is something that we can use out there as well with people, which is like, okay, hold on a minute. So you got your opinion about astrology. So what did you think about the Sumerians? And then they're going to be like, well, I, 
I don't know, like how many books have you read on Sumerians? <laughs> Man, none. Okay, would you feel comfortable to give any opinions about it? Not really. Well, how many books have you read about astrology? How much do you know about astrology? So why do you feel so compelled to give, you know, a verdict and an opinion about astrology without having any knowledge? So, yeah, it's like just bringing into the sort of healthy, let's have a healthy debate. And if, if, if they're really like fanatical, then I just don't have a conversation, I guess, because it's hard, yeah yeah it's a that's actually a really good way to counteract the strong opinion in one direction because I, I sort of asked if you have coping mechanisms because I do find that it's something that we encounter also a lot in the community that we're in so in the witchcraft community there's a lot of misinformation there's a lot of misconception there's a lot of judgment as well the minute you say it like it, people think you're like very strange or they often do so that's yeah. a good way to counteract it I really actually appreciate that suggestion um Paolo has another question which is can you speak a little bit about the Venus retrograde sure um, that's a great one yeah go on sorry interrupt. the meaning of the one starting now and how can this relate to their personal chart nice yeah sure I mean that's a great question because it's relevant to all of us now um and like I said what I love about astrology is that we can see as like you know when you draw a little but you throw a little pebble in the river and you got those like ripples. And, and I see that with all of the planetary cycles as well. We've got cycles within cycles, you know, um, Pluto would take 284 years to go around and the moon takes 28 days. And we're sort of like navigating all of these different cycles here at the same time. And so Venus going retrograde is happening tomorrow. So stationing tomorrow to go retrograde at 28 degrees Leo. We'll go all the way back to 12 degrees Leo um, on the 3rd of September. So it'll be until October, this Venus will be in Leo there. And um, what I love about retrograde cycle, so the planet appears to be going backwards from our perspective as a kind of an optical illusion, but it definitely has significance in astrology. And every planet has their own cycle of retrogradation. So Neptune, Saturn, Pluto, Uranus will be retrograde five months a year. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, apart from the sun and the moon for astronomical reasons but um but every other planet has their own retrograde sort of cycle and what I love about them and I really disagree with a lot of you know the fear mongering like oh there's a negative thing and you got a retrograde planet in your chart as bad um is that is an invitation to change direction so, so it's like literally you see the planet sort of changing direction in the sky and going backwards we're sort of invited to change our direction as well we're sort of invited to go inwards with that energy a little bit more so with venus will be an invitation to review everything that's venus related and venus will be related to self-worth self-love relationships how you love others how you show affection uh your love language it will be about how you dress how you feel attractive do you feel attractive do you not feel attractive a change in style you know and if you want to change in style you're reviewing your style that's venus as well it will be about money it will be about everything that we attribute value to or that we we, we we're challenged you know we we don't we can't you know like we, we're challenging our self-worth or our self-esteem you know those questions will be back to us now and um and money and finances is you know something that we attribute value to so shopping buying you know receiving how much money we're making how much money we're spending and what happens with astrology I think because it's connected to its symbols you know and symbolic language it's not easy to pin down it's like a cluster of ideas right it's a cluster of like colors and flavors that, that we have it's like a palette of colors and Venus it has all of these shades of like yellow or whatever color we want to attribute to and what happens and what the significance is to the natal chart is that it will tell us when we place in a natal chart it will give us the clue of how you're going to personally be working with that because some of you might be struggling with self-esteem more than finances or some of you might be in a sticky situation in a relationship much more than the other bits of venus you know it might not be about that um so i personally have venus in the house of friends so i have venus in the 11th house it might be connected with friends as well uh but what i love 
And what I'm really into Venus in this sort of last year, I think, the last year and a half, I don't know, I've been looking at that so seriously, is values. Values. It was something that I've always heard about and, you know, okay, values. Yeah, all right. But I kind of took it for granted. And I think this is the opportunity here for us is to look into our values, make a list, because we really need to base our self-esteem is related to how much we are aligned to our values, how much we honor our values when we make decisions, when we say yes to things, or when we form relationships to people that are cross-purpose to our values. We feel a bit, uh, we feel a bit dirty. We don't feel good about ourselves. So, so it's really important to have that awareness and 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 that clarity around values. What's valuable to you? What are your core values? You know. Like for me, authenticity is my core value. Integrity is another one and kindness is another one. You know, so so there are like resources on the internet. If you like Google during this retrograde, I really invite all of you to find one of these lists because they're they're everywhere. You can find lists of potential values. And then you do those exercises, you know, you sort of circul circulate the ones that that are really like important to you. And then you can see how much you're actually living a life based on that or not. Um, this is one of the key things about these Venus and, and that will have an impact on your self-worth, on your money, making money, not making money, et cetera. Like it's all in there, but find where your Venus is in your chart because it will tell us a little bit more like what your values tend to be and you know what this could be talking about. I mean, Leo is also, it's very much about self-esteem, I think, and like really feeling like a queen, a king, and you know, and just really demanding that sort of respect. And and it's about fun, how you have fun, how you have joy, you know, all of that is there as well in this cluster that we can review. And it will all depend on what you choose to work with, depending on what you're going through as well. So I hope that um that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant answer. Um, we have another one from Juliet, and this one's a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So she says, could you please explain how the North Node has an influence in our lives depending on the house and sign it's in? Is mm. it to reflect our life mission, or is it something we have to learn? No. Her North Node is in Scorpio, and her son is in Taurus. So mm -hmm. does that mean she needs to learn to embody her opposite or something along those lines? Nice. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, the North Node, the Lunar Nodes are very, very used in this other branch of astrology that's called evolutionary astrology or karmic astrology that really looks into past lives. And, and it's very interesting. I doubled into a little bit as well. Is a really, I have many books as well. And I really like that, um, that type of astrology too. Um, there is a book by Jim Spiller that I really recommend, and it's all about the lunar nodes, and it's called it's called Astrology for the Soul. Now, the way I see the lunar nodes is definitely an axis. So we're going to have the north and we're going to have the south. Excuse me. I don't believe that we need to completely let go of our south nodes and, you know, just totally go. It's like a pendulum, I, I guess. It's like a pendulum and a pendulum effect. We need to find the balance. So you're not far out there on what you're saying that you need to kind of integrate these oppositions somehow, you know, the Taurus, because you have your son in Taurus and the Scorpio as well, and find a kind of a middle ground there. What happens, the difference between the North and the South that I've observed is that usually the North node is out of our comfort zone. It's something that we, we haven't done much. We don't have much practice with. It's something that we feel quite uncomfortable. And especially when we're younger, we tend to fall a lot into our South node which is our comfort zone, is what we've been doing and we've been doing for ages. So if you consider past lives, we've been doing for many lives. So we're sort of here to learn how to embrace the opposite, but bringing the gifts forward. So it's not about just letting go and forgetting about, but kind of, you know, so I think about Taurus with Scorpio, it's like bringing the stability of Taurus, you know, the sense of groundedness, being grounded, owning yourself, self-possession I think that's a very Taurian thing so your ability to self-possess into uncertainty 
you know, because the rut of the South Node in Taurus is to be too attached to material things, to situation, being immovable, not going, not moving forward, etc. So it's like having that sense of dignity and self-possession and starting, you know, to go into the unknown, which is that Scorpio North node, you know, the sort of unknown, the 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 change, the depth and etc. The psychology and you know, but you bring your Taurus with you. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I see. And it definitely is very, very significant. I feel that the more we challenge ourselves to to go into our North Nodes, the more the universe responds with synchronicities. We get an opportunity, we get something that, you know, develops us really good for us. And it usually it's like a thumbs up from the universe. Something happens when we dare to go into our North Nodes a little bit. Um, yeah, and the house is definitely going to, work similarly you know the south node the house where the south node is we are also more comfortable there we're learning the things of the opposite house yeah yeah that really spoke to another question we had so i'm just wondering if um kane could you let me know if that kind of covered your question as well if not i'll ask it again but it was they were two very similar questions so let us know if you'd like us to still go deeper into your question um but in the meantime, Maria had the question of what if you don't know your exact time of birth? So I suppose, is there anything yeah. else to do if you don't know the exact time of birth? Yeah, well, there is uh, something that's called rectif rectification. So chart rectification. And there's some astrologers that are specialized in that. Um, and you should look for them. So what happens is, usually there is a sense of like oh it was in the morning my mom says it was in the morning or it was in the afternoon or something like that and then you can kind of play around with the time but if you have absolutely no idea then a professional that's like really trained in rectifying and have a lot of experience will sort of do that work with you and you can find the you know the most probable time based on life's um experiences and life situations because you're you know things that happen in our lives like like I had Pluto in my ascendant when I got my period the first time you know there's certain things that happens in our lives that are like sort of timed by these transits and progressions and different techniques of um of prediction you know techniques of sort of um yeah the sort of navigator side of astrology and we can move it to the past and see what happened you know when you moved countries or when something happened in your life that was really significant and they can trace it back and find the most um the most appropriate time but I guess we'd never know but they they can help you do that yeah yeah something you would do if you had somebody who came to you for a reading for example who didn't have their exact time of birth would you ask them about specific moments in their lives where you could kind of put put place markers where you can say well we can look back at that and say this yeah I mean yeah absolutely I mean I it's not my main expertise so for someone with zero idea like I, I'm, I probably refer it to somebody but if for someone that has a kind of an idea it's like oh maybe in the morning or maybe in the afternoon then I would um, be up for doing that and um, the idea is to request already like for the person to think about the big you know shifts in their lives as well like that they can think of pre you know ahead of the consultation so you can already have there like oh and and like some people might not remember as well so you have to um, take that into consideration like if you know if you do journaling for example you've been doing journaling for years then you have you know dates very precise and um but yeah, I would consider, I have done for people that had some doubts, not like a hundred percent, but like something, you know, they had something and I helped them to refine. Yeah. Chris, yeah. Just, if you're in the US, you can actually order a new birth certificate to request your birth time, which is interesting. I didn't know you could do that either. Nice. Not in the US, but um, mm -hmm. we have one other question that came through on Instagram, which I think it's sort of just interesting because it speaks to something that I think a lot of people ask, which is, when will I meet my future husband? And I'm more curious on whether you think that that's something that can actually be predicted by astrology. It's something that comes up a lot. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah, that's that's a good question. And again, like we can think about astrology in plural. Like if you if you go and see a Vedic astrologer, he will tell you like very exact, precise things like you're going to have an accident and 
you know, you're going to meet somebody, you're going to get married this year, or you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And I have to say that this always freaked me out a little. Like, I've never really wanted to, and I've always been very, very selective of who I allowed to read tarot to me, or, you know, because I feel that people might project a lot of things as well. And they might say things just because they're in a bad mood, or they might say things just because they want to feel important. And, you know, like, I'm the authority, so I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in your life. Whereas, and to Western for that, I guess, I, I really believe in free will. And I really believe that you, you can, you know, you can contribute and create your reality and et cetera. With, with all of that said, there are, you know, ways of seeing like, it's, it's, it's a strange one. Amar. I have to say, like, every time I flick through my ephemeris and I can see where the planets are going to be in like 2030. And it's like, oh, my God, Pluto is going to be my ascendant. What's going to be happening there? <laughs> so I have an idea and I have a sense like something big is going to be happening or um, and there are certain significators for relationships, you know, for like solidifying a relationship that the the astrology might be reflective of as well. But I always refrain from telling like, this is, you know, you're going to find someone here, you're going to do this, you know, I always like to do consultations on a more dialogue based and, and tell them potentials and tendencies, you know, because otherwise it becomes a bit of a fulfilling prophecy, you know. I have friends who have gone to readings where people said, you're going to meet your twin flame. And they were like searching for the twin flame forever. You know, <laughs> they weren't really looking at the actual people they were meeting on the way. And, and I, I don't know, I feel that it's got a detrimental effect, you know? Yeah. People, people resign from participating in life. They believe that something's going to magically happen and, you know, save them from their loneliness or I don't know. It's like, I don't know. Yeah, I really like that you mentioned that because for me sometimes um, the way some people read astrology can be a little bit too releasing any free will. This is going to be, happen to me now. This is going to happen then. This is how it's going to be. This is just set in stone and I can't change it anymore. And I don't, I don't really agree with that because I think you always have to also be an active participant in your own life. You can't just sit and wait for things to happen. And that really speaks to any witchcraft practice as well you can't expect to a good example is do a spell for a bad habit and then still continue and say you want to quit smoking and then still continue buying cigarettes like you're yeah. in it yourself so I, I really appreciate that you say that all of your readings and everything that you teach about astrology is really based on also free will and giving direction and suggestions and ways that you could use your chart to your advantage and where you could dig deeper to do some shadow work or to look inside or I just really appreciate that yeah I always think it's like it's about opening possibilities rather than just you know it's like oh you're having a Saturn trend there's going to be this oh you're having a there's going to be that you know there's so many possibilities for it and yeah all we need to do is brainstorm together you know I've got I know the astrological language and I can brainstorm with you you know into how you want to manifest this transit because you have that power and and knowing then helps you to respond to it as well like I I was mentioning now in the sky we have this Mars Saturn opposition and it, it does relate to a sort of a frustrating energy when we're really trying some things we're getting a slow down we're like hitting on the wall like we really cannot progress at the speed that we would like to but best to know that and sort of sit with it you know whatever is happening and if you are trying to move faster but it's not happening to kind of go inwards a little bit and be like right okay let me sit let me reassess the situation and see what best plan can I do and you know rather than just punching your way you know in a in a so I guess there is an element of you know it's, it's a funny one the question of free will because the transits are happening and they're there but you still have choice in how you're going to respond and how you're going to work with it. Yeah. And even just how you read it, you can always, as you said, you're a constructive astrologer. So rather than taking every retrograde as, I mean, Mercury retrograde has the worst reputation ever. You know, you can choose yeah. to constructively or choose to see it as everything's going to turn into a big pile of crap and I'm just going to go with it and let that happen to me rather than taking it as a way to to do something constructive or change or yeah or interesting so the way you did it I suppose um yeah 
definitely and it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy as well if you go to somebody who's supposedly an authority and they say the next five years are going to be horrible I mean (laughs) how do you shake that off like how you know (laughs) yeah with great difficulty because once it's in the back of your head and once you've internalized it it really is hard to get rid of it sort of stays in the back of your subconscious yeah I wondered if anybody has any other questions. We kind of have come to the end of our hour. So if you have another question, now would be the time to ask it. I did have one more from Instagram that I just wanted to, because I thought it was an interesting one. So it was, could you explain the different geometries and what they mean? So like a square, a trine. Nice, yeah, sure. Um, So so these geometrical positions from the planets, I like to think about them as dialogues. So I think it was Lise Green, which is one of my favorite astrologers of all times, that said, if you imagine the astrology chart to be um, a theater play, the planets will be the actors, the star signs will be the clothing and what they're wearing, what style they're wearing. The the houses will be the stage. So answers the question where. Uh, the aspects will be the dialogue. It will be the script. It will be like how... How are they actually dialoguing with each other? So the squares will be 90 degrees, will be reflective of tension. It will be reflective of like one is getting on the way of the other. And that's a configuration in our charts that we usually have to work throughout life. It's like, it's like we have to keep going to the gym and, you know, um, I was thinking about this um, these days, actually. It's like, we don't transcend our charts. Like, that's not how I see. I'm too very going for that. I don't think we transcend our charts. I think we get acquainted with certain placements and we we become friends with them and we're acknowledged them. And so if you have a square in your chart, it's there, it causes pain. You have to do something about it. It's a conflict, but you get acquainted with it. And every transit, every time the moon activates that, then you get in touch with it again and you get into, and that configuration gets invited to the stage, you know? And so you have a little interaction there. Anyhow, so the square is like attention, um, trines and sextiles, which are um, 120 degrees and 60 degrees between planets. They will be connected with gifts and things that we kind of easily express it, something that we can easily express in our lives. Uh, the oppositions will be that, that tension again is a, is, a, is a tense energy and it usually manifests in relationships a lot. We tend to project one end of the opposition and we tend to uh, project the end as a bit more complicated. So let's say you got some opposition Pluto, you're going to project Pluto to somebody else. It's always the other people that are being Pluto to you until we get a little older and we become acquainted with ourselves and our charts. Um, So oppositions have that sense of tension as well, seeing things from the two opposite ends and having that sort of split in ourselves as well. And and the conjunctions are like Siamese twins, you know, the conjunctions when they're like really close together, they work as a unit. There isn't one without the other. They're really always like working together. Uh, So the the conjunctions will be neutral depending on what planets you have involved, you know, they might be more tense if you have a Pluto Sun conjunction, it will be reflective of something deeper, more complex than if you have a Sun Venus conjunction, you know, Sun Venus will be you wanting to be nice and wanting to, you know, identifying with Venus and etc. So, so yeah, these are like the major aspects that we call it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So we have two more questions, if you're okay answering the last one. So one, can you please recommend a couple more books? And in that same question is, what's the difference between evolutionary astrology and your branch, which you've sort of said is psychological astrology? Nice. Yeah, sure. Um, Okay, so more books. It's for beginners, right? I guess um, that we're thinking here in terms of books. Okay, I really recommend Frank Clifford. So um, he's got a book about reading, you know, getting at the heart of your chart, I think is really great. And he's wonderful as well. He's got Gemini rising. He's really good at explaining things and like putting them in the, into that sort of like easy to digest context. And, and I really love it. Um, I have a lot of books. I have so many books and I need to think about that one um, because right there on the spot. Um, 
maybe and this is just a suggestion if it's okay with you it would be really nice to have a list of your maybe like three for each level so beginner intermediate and um yeah me a list and I can share that with everybody nice yeah sure let's do that because then I have time to like to think again because my books are basically in storage because I've been moving around so much so I, <laughs> I don't see them like so often and um yeah so I need to I need to think about them I definitely have loads because you know I got obsessed I bought so many um okay so now the difference between the um the astrology is here. So evolutionary astrology focuses a lot on the past life. And, and I, I find it really nice. I, I, I do enjoy it. But like I said, I think I've got too much Virgo in my chart. I'm, a, I'm sort of on the wall about past lives. It's like, I have a feeling that they're onto something and that it makes sense. But I also sometimes my Virgo sort of side says, yeah, but like sometimes people focus too much on the past life thing, you know, and it, it sort of is a way to abdicate from responsibility, you know, it's like, oh, but in the past life I was this, so now I'm this. But I know that the evolutionary astrologers that I've got books from and, you know, that's Stephen Forrest, um, Patricia Walsh as well. I love her book and I love her lectures as well. She's brilliant. And she wrote a book called Karmic Complexes, which I love. And she was working with a regression therapist and she had all of these data of people's memories, you know, past life memories, and she used their charts. And then it's a wonderful book. So, so they focus a little bit more on that sort of past life and, you know, spiritual journey. We sort of like here to it's like a soul retrieval process, you know, like as we have these past lives, so like let's say we die violently, we have a South Node in Aries. So we die in wars like so many times and then part of our souls get lost in, in those places and we need to sort of do a bit of a soul retrieval in order to evolve. So there's more on that sort of a spiritual evolution. Whereas the psychology, the psychological astrology is more on the sort of like, right, this is what we have. This is where we are now. Um, it's all about self-awareness and personal growth and accountability as well. It's like taking responsibility for your process and um, and and going into this more like Carl Jung and, you know, psychological interpretations of everything as well. And I don't deny that there is a spiritual reality in any way, but I don't feel like I am an authority you know, I, I'm not a, a priestess or like, I, I don't feel, I, I feel like I'd be deceiving my clients if I told them I know what this is about, because I don't think I do. Um, I'm open to the mysteries and, you know, and I invite the mysteries, but I'm, but I'm still, you know, maybe later in life, I'll become a priestess. I don't know, but I'm still, you know, and, and Liz Green, which is one of my favorite astrologers and the major influence in my work, she's, she's a Virgo. So, so I guess that sort of, um, that's the resonance there between us, but yeah, it tends to be a little bit more rational, I guess. Yeah. And focus more on that psychological process. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I guess the answer. Um, so very last question, and um, I think this will this will really be our last one. So do you, Anya says, what about astrology when we're twin flames? So I assume that means compatibility of um, astrological charts. Mm, yeah, well, I mean, what I know about twin flames, so I don't know like a huge deal about twin flames. I do know some, and I do know that usually is a difficult relationship. Like the idea of like, oh, my twin flame, and we're going to have this you know, amazing relationship and we're going to, et cetera. Like, I think what, from what I've heard and came across is usually very intense and very challenging as well. Like, cause you know, I don't know if twin flames actually end up together. And again, if, you know, people um, out there know more, you know, correct me and get involved in the discussion as well. But from what I know, People don't necessarily end up together because of that intensity. It's like um, it's like a taking a crash course in spiritual evolution and growth. You know, you, you just do it like bam, with that person like, really quickly. Um, what I would see in in a astrology would be a very prominent Pluto. Um, if you have a lot of Pluto interchanges, you know, and 
to personal planets i'm not just saying like pluto you know because pluto with pluto is like you're born in the same year or the same 10 years or something but like if there is a very strong and there is a technique for relationship astrology as well that's called composite charts which i really love is based on midpoints the one i use it as well which is basically creating a third chart based on two people i love it i think it's so revealing about the purpose of the relationship what the relationship is about and you know what kind of energy you create together and i think that would be a technique to look um when we're thinking about twin flames as well because it would be reflective you know it's like when you have a big stellium in scorpio and your composite chart you know i don't know that would be very reflective of a of a relevant you know sort of twin flame type of relationship yeah yeah composite charts getting into that because it's so interesting I love it I really really enjoy that technique it's so revealing and curious and yeah amazing yeah it's such a good suggestion and I didn't know that that was something you could do so it's amazing and you can do it with your you know you can do it with your family with your and you get to understand because you can you get to see how the relationship affects you as a person as well and vice versa you know you have a relationship with somebody that the planets fall on your ascendant on your sun on your moon and you're like oh my god I feel so alive with this person and I love to spend time with this person so the the composite can reveal so much that the synastry doesn't yeah yeah is that something that you do as well or yeah yeah absolutely yeah Great. yeah it's good to know yeah nice well um I love Q and A's and thank you so much for all the questions everyone has been great and you know thank you for having me as well and if anyone is interested in knowing more about astrology please get in touch um is my passion you know I'm teaching and mentoring and doing all sorts as well I give talks and and if you're interested please um get in touch um yeah yeah we always just so appreciate having you here you just have such a depth and wealth of knowledge and I think on behalf of everyone here and from Amethyst and myself also I just want to really extend like our most heartfelt gratitude to you for sharing your time and just so much knowledge with us it's mm really an honor and a privilege and I just appreciate it well, um, it's my pleasure yeah it's so great. we will close the session off there um thank you for being part of it for those of you who aren't part of TWC and if you'd like to know more you can send me an email and I would be happy to discuss any questions you have about it um and otherwise we're just so grateful for everybody's time and for being here especially you Fernanda and I hope you have a really lovely rest of the evening for me it's evening and weekend and we hope to see you all at our next live event nice thank you everyone bye bye